Yeah, because they're worried about scope creep. Mm -hmm. When I hear people worrying about scope creep, it tells me that their margins are too low. Hmm. So imagine, if you will, dear listener, think back to the last project where you felt like the scope creep got out of control. You had all of these fights uh, with the client and it was a nightmare. And even when you were done and everybody was, you know, finally as satisfied as they were going to get at the end, it maybe wasn't that great of a relationship, uh, probably ended on a bad note. Whenever you go over estimate, this is what happens. Imagine if you doubled, let's say your, let's say your estimate was a hundred thousand dollars. Let's say you priced it at 500,000. Now, did it feel like scope creep or now are you happy to make all those changes? Mm -hmm. So the problem is your prices are too low. Yeah. So the question is, but of course everyone right now is saying, but I would never have closed the deal at 500,000. Sure. How do you know that? What if you said, if you go into a client and you say, you start off by having a conversation you know, they'll sort of, they'll bring you in your initial contact. Uh, they'll kind of give you a brain dump about the, you know, what, what's on their mind. They're thinking about the project. They're thinking about, they're probably thinking too far ahead about all these little details that they want. Uh, they're very excited about it. It's a big initiative. They want to get it done. It's probably already behind schedule. And you, you know, you listen to that, you take notes, it goes on for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, they finally exhaust all of that information. And then you ask them to back up a little bit and say, all right, this is great, super helpful. Let's back up for a second. Um, why, you guys, why do you guys, you know, I can see that you picked a way to solve this problem. Why did you pick this way? Why do you want to solve it in this way? Why wouldn't you just not do the project at all? Why wouldn't you just um, buy an off-the-shelf piece of software to do this for you? Why do you think about solving it this way? Why not just hire more employees instead of building this software product or building this website? Why not just build out your call center? And, and push back on them uh, and, and discover their actual business motivation for solving the, whatever the, the business problem or, the, or capturing the business opportunity, whatever that is, find out what it is, and, and gain some confidence that they're actually uh, have chosen a solution that is going to do that for them. Because sometimes they just get excited about the idea of, you know, <laughs> We, we need to be, we need to have a blockchain product, you know, <laughs> you know, and they sell cars and it's like, okay, I see you're all excited about this particular solution, but you haven't told me what the problem is yet. So let's just back up and make sure that this type of a solution is really the, you know, the most, the best use of resources. Uh, and I, I can't, cause I'm, I don't want to take your money if you're not going to make it back tenfold. Right. So let's make sure first. Okay. Then they convince you, yes, this is the reason we can't, we can't use off the shelf. We have to do this. Then you work into, you know, why do you need to do this now? How urgent is this? Is this? Can't we study it for a while? Uh, couldn't you do it in six months? How come you didn't do it a year ago? What changed? And you find out the level of urgency of the project, uh, the project. And then lastly, you say, well, why would you bring in someone expensive like me? I mean, you know, I'm not going to be the cheapest option. So why wouldn't you outsource this? Why wouldn't you hire some interns to do this? Why wouldn't you use your internal staff to do this? Mm. And they'll have answers for all those questions or you'll talk them out of doing the project and then you just dodged a bullet. <laughs> so uh, if, once you have, once you have all those answers, because you're, you're writing notes furiously as they're telling you the answers to these questions and you write down their exact words, uh, paying special care to capture any emotionally charged language, like, um, freaking us out, or this would be huge for us, or, you know, I'll kiss you on the lips if this actually works, <laughs> you know, you write all that down. And then when, it, when you are convinced at the end of the project, at the end of the conversation, I call it a why conversation, when you're convinced at the end of that, that there is a mutually beneficial, the possibility of a mutually beneficial relationship between uh, you and this potential client, then you can say to them, you know, look, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I, I'm convinced that, that there's value in working together. What I'd like to do is go back to my office, huddle up with the team or by myself, you know, if you're a soloist. And I'd like to put together three options for you. They're going to range in price somewhere from $80,000 on the low end to 500000 on the high end. Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, 500000 Well, may, they might not. They might say yes. They might say, oh, 500000 is way too high. And you just sort of like nod your head. I understand. I'll, I'll give you an option in the $80,000 range. But I do want to, I want to give you a full range of options. 
they'll say, okay, you know, what do they care? They can always say no. At this point, I have not even thought one bit about what I'm going to do for them. I haven't thought about how many hours. I haven't thought about scope. I haven't thought about whether I'm going to do uh, Ruby on Rails or React Native. I haven't thought about that at all. Mm -hmm. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But what I have found out is how urgent the project is, why they can't use cheaper alternatives. I've found out uh, why they need to do this specific kind of thing. And I've found out all of their specific reasons, not the general abstract reasons that we imagine people, you know, oh, we want, they want more efficiency or whatever. We have the exact language that the client themselves use to say why this specific thing was so important to them to invest in with a premium resource. So now I can go back. What that does is it gives me a sense of how much it's worth to the, the client. So they imagine that this is a very big deal for a very big company. It would be comical for them to make less than let's say a million dollars a year of incremental revenue uh, based on this alone even if we only get halfway to the home run so i can go back and i look at those i look at their value their probable rough value uh, on an annual basis of this project how much it's probably worth to the organization and i'll say okay i kind of give myself a budget like okay if i was going to give myself a budget of say five hundred thousand dollars to, to uh, maximize the chances of this delivering that million dollars a year, what would I do? How, what, pull out all the stops. Who would I call? Who would I put on the team? What team would I assemble? What are the things that I would do? Would I put people on site? Would I buy some, would I license some software? I, now I have this almost like a budget where I can think very freely about how I'm going to achieve the desired outcome and say, oh, for, yeah, for 500000 I would totally do all of this stuff. And then I'd have a, a, a nice 100% margin to boot. And then I'll you know, do the same thing with the other options. So the, the highest option is the one that's the least risky to the client. It's the maximum chances of them achieving the desired outcome. On the low end, so the, I think I said $80,000 end, I might say something like, okay, you know, you know, here's the $500,000 option, but $80,000 end, what we can do is sell you a block of a hundred hours. Uh, there's no guarantee that we'll actually finish the project in that time. We have no way of knowing uh, there are still way too many things that are not defined. So what you can do is give us 80 grand. That'll buy you a block of, you know, whatever I said, a hundred hours, a thousand hours. It'll buy you this block of hours. Uh, we will, you guys will do your own project management. You will set up the, whatever the, you know, set up Jira, we'll yeah. log in, we'll do the tasks, we'll bang through it. Um, you won't have any access to the principles of my firm. It will really just be, we'll give you four bodies basically. And then in the middle, you've got some option that is sort of, is a little bit like a, com- a more collaborative combination of your resources and their resources and, you know, more, uh, maybe more access to the principles of the firm and this sort of thing. So I think the important thing to point out there is that there's a big margin at each of those points. In other words, your cost as the provider is maybe half of the price that you set because you've, you've kind of reverse engineered what you're going to do to fit the price. And if you leave yourself some margin in there, Scope creep becomes a non-issue. Like I never, ever have worried about scope creep in 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I've been fixed pricing the whole time. But I base my prices on value, not on time and materials. If you do a fixed price based on time and materials, you get killed every time. Mm-hmm. And so do you find that, um, that uh, you know, that maybe there is times where some things go over what – I mean, because are you, are you still – because again, like I – I've worked for some large organizations. I've worked for small organizations. And the word utilization comes up quite a bit, right? How well are these these team members being utilized, right? So let's say I am doing that value-based pricing. Should I also be tracking my utilization? Like, um, You mean internally for your own? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm being able to kind of prove the point that the value that we're, that we're placing around this is actually of value. You could do that. That's a common question. If, but to me, it indicates that you're still thinking about it wrong. Mm. You're, you, you, again, to me, that's like, am I trying to maximize 
my this investment I have in this person's salary. That's not the point. Right. <laughs> you should be doing so much better. You know, so I think Blair ends Blair ends is like a genius at this when it comes to larger firms. So if you if you've got a uh, hundred, two hundred, three hundred person firm, uh, he is the guy. Mm-hmm. Like he is the one that understands that. I mostly work with you know firms that are ten or lower, mostly solo people. Sure. Uh, so a lot of this, a lot of this is uh, I credit Blair for uh, with the larger firms. And honestly, I don't. You know, it, well, back, let me back up. How do you know if you're how do you know if you're profitable at the end of the year? You made way more money than you spent, <laughs> you know, so like your P&L, that's what your P&L is for. Right. The the necessity to break it down on a per person per project level to me uh, seems like a, a you know, just it, it, it's timesheets. Mm-hmm. It's 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 a waste of time. Mm-hmm. You know who your good employees are. They're the ones you like being around. And if you're making tons of money, see, I, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is when you when your margins are not razor thin, these things don't matter. Like if you're floating checks all the time and worried about uh, making payroll mm-hmm. and who do I need to lay off, you need to base it on a very financial sort of, you know, bottom line right. type of decision. But when you're doing well and you're delivering amazing work to to clients who are want to build a statue of you in front of their building because it was such a huge success. Mm -hmm. These things evaporate into the background. A lot of this stuff comes from hourly billing because there is no profit in it. It profit is not built in. One of the stories that you tell in uh, your book, hourly billing is nuts, um, which I really enjoy because I have a similar one. Um, where you talked about a client that uh, wanted to talk repeatedly about their personal life and other things, mm-hmm. and you had a certain quota to bill by the uh, end of each week. You didn't really know what to do at that time, right? Yes. When, so when I was still a, a developer employee, billing, you know, I was still billable, basically. Um, I was on the hook for, I think it was 30 hours a week needed to be billable. And we had like 10 hours a week that were, you know, for admin and going to the bathroom and lunch and all that. Sure. And yeah, and this one, one client, he was, I mean, we would be on the phone for hours. He, it was almost like pair programming <laughs> and it, it honestly got to the point where it felt very dependent and, but he had tons of money and he really enjoyed it. It was almost like a hobby for him. And it, but it, you know, and we kind of got close in a weird way. Mm-hmm. So when when things, you know, when we would finish working on some module of the system, he would tell me some story about how he proposed to his wife or uh, how he talked his way out of a, a speeding ticket the other day. <laughs> and and he was a uh, you know a you know an extrovert, so he would talk for a long time. And it was funny, and mm-hmm. I felt like it deepened the relationship. But it presented me with a problem. <laughs> which was that I needed those hours. I needed yeah. to build those. Right. So I call it pulling out the baseball bat. So I'd say, you know, listen, this has been great, but I, you know, I can't, I, I have to get back to work uh, because I'm responsible for a certain number of billable hours. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And it would get better for a while. And then I would pull out the baseball bat and be like, I'm, I'm putting down these two hours of chatter as billable. So through that conversation about your wife, you know, proposing to your wife at a Knicks game, 200 bucks. <laughs> and you can imagine how he reacted to that and then we would <laughs> fight about that for two hours and you should be somebody who's in a service business. I mean, yes, there's a certain limit, but if you're in a service business and a client wants to share personal details about their lives, you should be jumping for joy. Yeah. They trust you deeply. They view you as a partner. They, it's the ideal situation. Right. The reason it, the reason it was not ideal was because I was billing by the hour. And if we had, if I had just given him, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not saying it would have worked in this case. If we had given him a, you know, a high upfront price and we broke out each module and said, okay, this module is going to be $50,000. Do you want to go forward or not? Um, then, you know, he might've said no, but cause not everybody's going to go for it. Uh, when they, when they actually see the price instead of like later, like, Oh, I can't believe I, you know, I can't believe we spent that much money and we feels like we're no closer to the goal. And it's like, yeah, because you're, I'm supposed to be driving the bus, but you're driving it. 
Well, you let me take the wheel. I'll get us there. And then you'll.